Hello, and welcome to Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I'm Jeff Mays, political reporter with DNA Info New York. President Donald Trump's executive order on immigration bars citizens of seven Muslim-majority countries from entering the United States for a 90-day period and suspends the admission of all refugees for 120 days. The ban applies to U.S. green card holders re-entering the United States from seven countries, Iraq, Syria, Iran, Sudan, Libya, Somalia, and Yemen. Trump's actions set off legal challenges and protests around the country, including here in New York City, where protesters took to the streets and flooded JFK Airport. New York's Mayor Bill de Blasio criticized the ban and called it un-American. This is a city of immigrants we always have been for almost 400 years. This is our fundamental nature. The stroke of a pen in Washington does not change the people of New York City or our values does not change how this city government protects its people. Joining me today to discuss this further is Angela Fernandez, Executive Director of Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much. So let's start off. Tell me a little bit about the executive orders that mm -hmm. uh, President Trump signed. There are two. Mm -hmm. The first one uh, bans refugees from several countries. And then there was also another executive order that had to do with funding to sanctuary cities. So let's start off with the refugee executive order. Tell me about that mm -hmm. and what does it specifically do? Okay. As you stated in your opening, it focuses on banning the entry of uh, people from uh, these seven uh, Muslim-majority countries. Um, and uh, one of the uh, concerns around that um, is that uh, it also included um, uh, dual nationals, so individuals who have a uh, citizenship uh, from the United States and also are dual citizen from Iran, for example. They would be barred um, from coming in. Now, because of the chaos that that created um, uh, at the airports in the United States, um, the White House did come back and say that they're making some adjustments to that. Uh, number one, dual nationals um, will not be turned away. The green card holders, um, they say that they will be letting them in, but they will be looking at them on a case-by-case -case basis. That is still very, very alarming. Green card holders are, um, uh, are, are legal um, immigrants paying taxes. Um, uh, they are author absolutely authorized to work here. Um, uh, the only difference between a legal permanent resident and a U.S. citizen is that they don't have the right to vote until they're naturalized. These are people who have businesses. These are people who have established ties. Um, uh, and, uh, and so that's a, a huge concern. The second piece is um, this permanent bar of refugees from Syria. The United States purports to be fighting against terrorism, yet we are not helping and providing cover uh, protection to those people who are being terrorized by the terrorists. Um, before a refugee even steps on a plane to come to the United States, they've already gone through two years of vetting um, uh, for security purposes. Many refugees who are actually completely innocent and have no ties to terrorists don't even make it through that process um, through some kind of technicality. Um, so this idea that um, uh, there has to be this extreme vetting extreme vetting has already been done. And what about the idea that these seven countries are somehow linked to terrorism? And mm -hmm. I know there are some countries such as Saudi Arabia, the U uh, United Arab em mm -hmm. Emirates, mm -hmm. um, and Egypt mm -hmm. that are not on this list where mm -hmm. there have been people who have conducted mm -hmm. terror attacks on America. Tell me about that. Are those seven nations the threat that the uh, mm -hmm. Trump administration is making them out to be? There has not been uh, one act of terrorism um, in our country um, coming or generating from uh, those um, seven banned countries. Another piece I would like to add that shows um, the lack of understanding on the complexity of how the world functions. Uh, one person um, who uh, wasn't able to come into the country, she was born in Sudan, yet never grew up there, or grew up in a completely different country. Um, she was coming to do a medical residency um, at uh, one of the national hospitals here. She wasn't able to come in because she, her birth certificate said the Sudan. We are in a lot of trouble here in this country when our president and his advisors do not understand how the world functions and how human beings travel already around the world and um, through living life um, are going to have um, a birthplace in one country yet raised in another country. We're in a lot of trouble if we, as a government, can't understand that level of complexity. This seems to be an unprecedented um, action. Tell us a little bit about the United States and its history with refugees, right? We've taken in, uh, we've always taken in refugees, correct? 
We have taken in refugees, but the United States has always struggled um, uh, as well. Uh, during World War II, um, uh, the United States turned away uh, Jewish refugees um, uh, and turned them back um, uh, uh, to Germany. Um, uh, and to other parts of, uh, of Europe that at the time had been dominated by, uh, by Germany and to some of them to their deaths. So we actually have a spotted history, but one would think that at this point and at this level, we would have gone beyond that and be a leader in how to uh, accept uh, refugees, how to accept people who are seeking asylum. We've actually taken many steps back. For example, um, which, which has been happening now for a number of years. If someone comes to seek asylum, so they are coming in and then once they step here, they, they are going to request asylum, they are taken off the plane and placed in detention for months right. until they can be interviewed for their credible fear um, uh, interview, which is done by an immigration agent. And that immigration agent has to determine um, whether that person actually truly has a credible fear of returning their country and decide whether they can stay or not. How is this affecting people that are here? Because um, you, you have people in this country, and New York City specifically, mm -hmm. that are students, that mm -hmm. are researchers that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, is this going to affect people's ability to travel, to move mm -hmm. about? And what are you advising mm -hmm. people to do at this point who may be uh, green card holders, sure. for example? Our organization works with um, uh, majority um, uh, legal permanent residents because we help them um, uh, through the process to become citizens and also as they um, uh, apply for family-based petitions. Those that come from those seven countries, um, uh, there we have advised people to not leave um, uh, the United States. Although the White House said that it's changed its directive um, around the treatment of green card holders when they come in to the United States, um, we still think that we, t we would take a wait and see approach. That's number one. Number two, um, for uh, individuals that come from any other uh, country coming into the United States or they want to leave, um, uh, we, we advise that they can still leave, um, yet there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Number one, when you return to the United States, um, if a Customs and Border Patrol says to you um, that you should sign a document called an I-407, which says that you are voluntarily abandoning your lawful permanent residency status, um, do not sign that document. If you sign that document that says that you are not only voluntarily abandoning your legal permanent residency status, but you are also waiving your right to a court hearing wow. on your status. If you do that, you will be put back on a plane and sent back to the con your country of origin. That's number one. Number two, they may coerce you and say, if you don't sign this document, we will detain you. Take the detention and wait until you get an attorney. Even if you come back into the United States after having been out of the country as a green card holder for quite some time, let's say for, say to, let's say for a year or two years because you had some kind of family emergency that you need to deal with, and they'll say to you, well, you abandon your residency because you're out of the country. That act by itself is not abandoning your residency. You would say, no, let's go to a court hearing. I'm not signing that document. I'm going to get an attorney. And then the judge has to determine whether you actually truly abandoned your residency or not. And I think this is an important piece that the community needs to understand because Customs and Border Patrol agents will use that as a reason and say you were out of the country for too long so you abandoned your um, residency de facto. That's not the case. So please do not sign that document. And that's happened already, right? There have been a few instances, I believe there were a couple of men from Iraq that mm -hmm. signed that document and mm -hmm. were immediately sent back. So yes. this is something that's going on as far as you know. It, it's already happened in the past, um, uh, not, you know, not frequently, but it, you know, it, it did happen. It clearly happened over this weekend, um, uh, much more, and we anticipate that it could happen more. Um, uh, more frequently, so we just want people to be aware right. and alerted. Now, uh, you're an advocate. The people have not taken this sitting now, right? There were widespread protests mm -hmm. over this issue. Mm -hmm. um, several people filed court orders. There were several injunctions mm -hmm. issued. Tell me about that legal process that we're going through now. Mm -hmm. Is there any question of whether this is actually illegal or mm -hmm. violates the U.S. Constitution? Mm -hmm. And where do you think we're headed in terms of those court decisions? Well, there are a number of different court cases that have been filed. Um, uh, clearly, um, there are um, uh, elements of these ex uh, executive orders um, uh, that are unconstitutional. Um, but uh, I would argue uh, that the focus should be 
on um, uh, the entire the entirety of the executive orders as being um, unconstitutional, um, and that those should that that should be the fight in the courts and the focus on so that they could be completely stopped. That's exactly what the Republicans did when President Obama signed an executive order um, that expanded DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and also provided um, uh, the parents, uh, undocumented parents of U.S. citizens, an ability to apply for work authorization um, and a stay of removal. The, uh, uh, the Republicans went and filed an injunction in a Texas court. They found a federal judge that was empathetic, um, and that, that um, injunction stopped that executive order in its tracks. Um, what's your opinion on this? Is it discriminatory? Because there been some points that uh, the executive order maybe um, prioritizes Christians uh, mm -hmm. over Muslims, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. and in just singling out these several countries, which are mm -hmm. Muslim-majority countries, um, wh what are your thoughts on the, the intent I, of this I, order? I think it's very telling um, uh, that the Christian leaders of this country have come out in opposition to the executive order that specifically says that those who are a religious minority in these countries will, um, uh, will be accepted as refugees. Um, uh, and so, so I, I will let the Christian religious leaders in this country who have come out against this, and I think that simply right there says that yes, this is discriminatory. Are you concerned this is the beginning of uh, some other major changes in our country? Where, where do you see this, this headed? President Trump has um, uh, appointed um, into his closed circle uh, individuals um, who have said very clearly um, uh, and have said it through the Breitbart website as propagandists um, that their view of a strong nation is a strong nation that is um, uh, led by uh, immigrants or, and or Americans of European descent of white European descent. Um, this is what they have said. This is not what I'm saying. This is not what other people have said. And to have those individuals um, uh, advising and working so closely with the president right now, I think is of great concern. And I think it is very important that we discuss this and speak about it in a calm way, but speak about it um, and educate the rest of the country about this. because. I don't know if people were aware that this was what was going to happen. Um, and, so, and so I think it's just something that we need to be very, very alert. And it is very important that we, be, we take extra care, um, that we reach out to our neighbors, that we get to know our neighbors, no matter of what race, no matter of what, I, I, would, I would refrain from blaming um, uh, any, any population, um, even for the election of Trump. Um, uh, I think that we need to we need to really keep our wits about us and be very cool-headed about this, um, uh, and and make sure that our elected officials who are in Congress right now um, uh, stop at every moment any kind of activity or action that could lead to um, some very terrible things in this country. Now, New York City is a place that typifies uh, the immigrant experience, right? We have. Uh, uh, 500,000 undocumented immigrants mm -hmm. here, and I believe 40 percent of the population is foreign-born. Mm -hmm. um, what are you seeing as the effects right here in New York City? Have you been talking to people, or mm -hmm. are people having family members that can't come over? Mm -hmm. What's happening right here in New York mm -hmm. City? Well, first, there's a tremendous amount of um, uh, concern um, uh, and fear in the undocumented community. Mayor Bill de Blasio has done um, uh, an incredible job in ensuring and maintaining that this be a sanctuary uh, city. Um, I think the commissioner of um, uh, police of the NYPD um, is clear in that his, um, uh, his uh, the police force is not going to act as immigration agents, and there are actually you know, laws that, that protect us from that. Uh, but um, I think that there is cause for concern still, um, uh, and, and that is communicated, and it's starting to be com communicated um, from not only the undocumented community, um, but also the, uh, the, the documented community. And so there was a second executive order that President mm -hmm. Trump signed, and uh, this executive order um, ordered the Department of Homeland Security, the Attorney General, to pull funding from sanctuary cities, mm -hmm. um, which New York City is one, which mm -hmm. you mentioned. Tell us a little bit about what a sanctuary city is, mm -hmm. and uh, should New York City be concerned about losing its federal funding? Sure. So there is no set 
definition of what a sanctuary city is. We can give you examples of how sanctuary cities behave. Um, so a perfect example is when a locality, and it can even be a town, mm -hmm. decides, you know what, we are not going to have our local police um, behave and stop people um, and ask them for their immigration status and make determinations on their immigration status and as a result arrest them, in, put them in local custody and then transfer them over to the immigration detention system, okay? So that's an example of a, when a city is a, a sanctuary city. Um, and, I, and New York City is, is a clear um, uh, example of that. But that's after through a lot of fighting and through a lot of organizing um, uh, in stopping uh, the practice which had been happening historically from the Department of Corrections, where from Department of Corrections, people were being transferred over to, to ICE. Um, uh, what, what, what a city can't do, for example, is ICE has the right to go to people's homes. There's nothing a city can do to stop a um, ICE official um, from going to someone's home to arrest them and deport them. We want them to, but, but, the, but, but the laws don't allow it. Um, and so that is something that is of concern. And ICE has already been going to the doors of green card holders and arresting them. They may have had an old misdemeanor conviction from 20 years ago. Um, uh, going to undocumented homes and arresting them. And because the executive order on interior enforcement increases um, the amount of um, uh, ICE officials three times, threefold, oh. we know that um, uh, there are going to be people knocking, um, that these enforcement officers are going to be knocking on people's doors and our advice to people is to not open that door. They have to show a warrant, slip it under the door. If they come in, People should have their cameras ready, filming and posting it on social media immediately. So Mayor de Blasio has been very clear that New York will remain a sanctuary mm -hmm. city, that mm -hmm. they will not, not cooperate right. with federal immigration authorities. Um, and that could cost the city uh, billions of dollars mm -hmm. in federal aid mm -hmm. um, at this point. Should people uh, who are undocumented or have um, other uh, immigration statuses, should they be concerned in the city now? I know there's been some talk over the ID NYC program, which mm -hmm. has given um, identification to some undocumented mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. um, should there be a concern with people about accessing city services or signing up for an uh, uh, ID NYC? What are you telling people mm -hmm. who are coming to you with, mm -hmm. with fears and concerns? So, well, so first of all, in terms of the, having the federal funding removed, I mean, there are there is a court case um, uh, that actually um, uh, uh, protects from that. Um, so we'll see, you know, how that plays out. But there is some protection from um, from from the president stopping the federal funding um, into sanctuary cities. When the NYC ID was about to be rolled out, um, the uh, there were some members of the coalition, including our organization, Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights, that were concerned about the requirement that the city keep copies of the proof of residency of all of the applicants for two years. Right. No other municipality had that requirement um, uh, for the other municipalities who have, um, who have city IDs for, for immigrants. We actually then left the coalition um, uh, in, in, um, in opposition to that. Fast forward to today and this reality, Mayor de Blasio came out and said that they will destroy um, the underlying documents for the people who had, who had applied um, uh, over the last two years. Uh, and um, uh, and then there was a injunction filed from two um, uh, assembly members from Staten Island um, uh, saying that the, they should not be destroyed. The injunction still stands, but my understanding that my understanding is that the court case will will, will come to to a finality, and that um, there are some signals that um, uh, the injunction will be removed. Um, of course, we won't know until we see it. Going forward, um, uh, the city is continuing to encourage people to apply for the NYC ID and that they are pledging and promising that now they're not going to keep copies of the underlying proof of residency um, uh, and, and so that they're saying that that's the, that's the protection going forward. Um, uh, we um, have, uh, have always advised because of, what, of how we felt for people not to apply for the NYC ID in terms of undocumented um, folks, but that's a position um, of our organization. Um, uh, and one thing that is a protection around the NYC ID is that everyone is asked to apply, even U.S. citizens. Right. Um, and that provides um, a level of protection when looking at the totality of um, a database where there is no identification in the database from our understanding on the status of, right. of the immigrant. It's just that it's where, you know, where people have lived. And what about things like education? I know uh, 
the school's chancellor, Carmen Farina, came out yesterday, told parents that they would not be checking immigration status, that school was still open to all individuals. Tell me a little bit about that. The U.S. Supreme Court settled that a long time ago. That was settled in the 1980s. Um, for K-12 school, K-12 public education, um, uh, the schools are not to turn away any student, especially based, uh, based on their um, immigration status. Um, and so and we know that over the last couple of years there have been schools outside of New York City who ask for a social security number. Um, and if they don't have a social security number, this, this, the student, they can't come in, to the, they can't enroll in the school. That is illegal. If you don't have a social security number, you can still come and attend that school. You have to show proof of residency of living in the school district. Um, uh, so, so you know, so th that that hasn't changed. That still stands, and it should continue to stand. Um, so, and also, you mentioned you talked a little bit about the police and 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 their stance on this. Uh, one of the reasons uh, Mayor De Blasio has said that the city is a sanctuary city is because they do want everyone of every immigration status to cooperate police where mm -hmm. necessary to increase public safety. Mm -hmm. um, are you concerned about that with uh, these executive orders from the president that mm -hmm. that will sort of uh, give people pause in terms of contacting the police mm -hmm. and dealing with the police? So I th for New York City, I do not have concerns about that. For New York City, um, uh, immigrants should continue. Um, uh, if they see a crime, they should um, feel comfortable reporting it to the police. Um, uh, we have not heard of any stories um, uh, of, of police um, uh, engaging um, in any behavior um, uh, for, for, you know, in any behavior where a person would be placed in deportation proceedings after speaking to them here um, uh, in the city. Um, so I would like to, you know, calm any fears um, around that. We're, we're a safer city. Um, when, when all immigrants and all individuals um, feel like they can turn to their police um, for help. So tell me a little bit about what's next. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was reading some stories that there are other possible uh, immigration executive mm -hmm. um, orders coming. Mm -hmm. um, how are you guys planning uh, to move forward as, as, mm -hmm. we, as we move ahead in, mm -hmm. in this uh, mm -hmm. issue? Well, it's interesting that, you know, there's a talk about the other ones moving forward when there's still so much to mine in the executive orders that exist uh, right now. Um, uh, there are other pieces of, of the executive orders that have already been signed that people need to be speaking about and, um, uh, and alerting their elected officials um, uh, about. So, for example, um, uh, the executive order says that it will um, uh, uh, expand and revive the 287G program. 287G uh, program is an, an, an old program um, that deputizes local police and state police to um, uh, behave as immigration agents. Um, and uh, we know that the reason that had started to roll back is because a lot of local police were extremely unhappy about this. This was making communities less safe. Right. Um, uh, where when an immigrant feels that, okay, I can't talk to this person um, because they may place me in deportation proceedings, um, uh, that, is, that, is, that creates a very unsafe situation. And secondly, people who want to commit crimes against immigrants are going to know. If there's a 287G program in place in a town, they can keep victimizing the same immigrants over and over again because those individuals are not going to go to the police. Um, so, so this is of great, of great concern to us. Another um, uh, piece uh, to the present executive order, which is around interior enforcement, um, is that uh, they want to put out uh, reports on um, uh, convictions lists committed, of crimes, right? lists of crimes um, uh, committed by um, uh, any alien. So this is green card holders. This is, and I think that, you know, one thing we have to keep in mind is that um, uh, the. Uh, vast majority of, um, uh, of crimes um, are misdemeanor, um, non-violent, uh, um, uh, non-threat to public safety crimes. But what that communicates, and also immigrants have a lower percentage of criminality than U.S. citizens. Right, there's no link, there's no correlation between immigration in, and crime. In fact, in fact, the cities in this country that have high rates of immigration have a um, uh, have have an imp have a what's the what's the what's the what's the, what's the word not disproportionate but a corollary yeah. where crimes continue to go down in right. those cities. We even have cities in the Rust Belt a few years ago inviting openly inviting undocumented immigrants to their cities because they know of the benefits that immigrants bring 
economically and, and, and other related to that. So, um, uh, so I think that um, stating that we're now going to publish the lists of convictions committed by um, immigrants is going to create um, uh, uh, a very um, uh, poor perception um, and inadequate and inaccurate perception of criminality um, uh, within a certain community and will invite vigilante justice um, uh, by individuals who say, oh, well, I just read yesterday that, um, uh, that 10,000 uh, crimes have been committed by immigrants when they don't detail that it could be for possession of marijuana, right. or it could be for, which is a violation in New York City, um, uh, or it could be for um, selling uh, water on a subway platform. Right. So, you know, this is something we need to really also have a, a continue to have and continue to have the conversation that Black Lives Matter started around um, how people are criminalized in this country and how, um, which is something that we've been talking on the immigration side, but it hasn't been as strong, um, but we have to follow that lead. And, and educate um, the, the public at large. 30 seconds, tell me what people should be doing right now uh, if they disagree with what's happening with these <clears throat> executive orders. Continue to go to the protests. That is um, uh, the most um, uh, clear way to communicate um, uh, our disagreement with what's happening. Uh, number two, please give to your local community-based organizations. Um, and I don't say this just because I am the executive director of a local community-based organization. Um, there are many of our sister organizations. We are the ones that are feeling the brunt um, of the people coming in from the street, as it should be. But we need more funding so we can hire more staff, so we can hire more community organizers, so we can hire more attorneys, so we can hire volunteer coordinators. We have so many people that want to volunteer with us, but we need, I need a staff member that can help me coordinate right. um, all of that. So please give to your local community-based organization. I, I recommend even giving on a monthly. Say, I'm going to give to this organization that's down the block from me that I know does good work, $10 a month. Right. Um, if we can do that en masse, it will help us build our, reinforce ourselves and build our forces for the fight that we have ahead. Excellent. I want to thank my guest, Angela Fernandez of Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights, for being here. And thank you for watching Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. I'm Jeff Mays. Goodbye.